I'm Brendan McCormick, Medical Director of Home Dialysis at the Ottawa Hospital and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. Today's presentation is entitled Sodium Sieving. This program is sponsored by and on behalf of Baxter Healthcare Corporation. I'm contracted by Baxter Healthcare Corporation to present this information on Baxter's behalf. The movement of water across the peritoneal capillary and exclusion of sodium is termed sodium sieving. This module will review the basic principles of peritoneal membrane physiology, solute clearance, and ultrafiltration with the focus on sodium sieving. The peritoneal membrane has been classically described as having three layers. A superficial layer of mesothelial cells, a submesothelial compact zone or subcompact zone of loose connective tissue, and the peritoneal capillary bed. Of these three layers, it has been determined that the filter that creates the diffusion gradient that allows for dialysis to occur is across the peritoneal capillary wall. Here again, this time in three dimensions, we see the three major components of the peritoneal membrane. As mentioned, the peritoneal capillaries appear to be the anatomic location of diffusion that allows blood-borne toxins to move from the plasma into the dialysate. These capillaries have endothelial cells that have clefts, which are gaps of varying size in which the blood-borne toxins egress into the dialysate, as illustrated on the next slide. Again, endothelial cells in the peritoneal capillary wall allow for the egress of blood-based toxins into the dialysate. The toxins in the dialysate were analyzed in terms of size and constitution, leading to the theoretical three-poor model. In this model, researchers determined that there were peritoneal capillary endothelial clefts of a larger size, as they noted small amounts of protein molecules diffusing into the dialysate. These large pores were believed to be few in number, relatively, as the dialysate did not contain large amounts of blood proteins. They determined that there must be smaller clefts, termed small pores, as the dialysate contained substances smaller than proteins, urea and creatinine, for example. They determined that there must be a much larger number of these small pores as there was more diffusion of smaller molecules into the dialysate compared to the larger molecules. And they determined that there must be pure water pores, determined to be aquaporins, as the dialysate showed excess water movement into the dialysate compared to the toxin movement. This became the three-pore model of dialysis across the peritoneal capillary during peritoneal dialysis. Aquaporins have been demonstrated to richly populate the peritoneal capillary walls as demonstrated by this immunostaining and immunoprecipitation. Again, aquaporins are permissive only to water, H2O, by creating an initial size restriction but then causing the negatively charged oxygen molecule to be drawn into the site flipped onto the two hydrogens by water dipole reorientation, and then the molecule exits with the two hydrogens leading. This is why the aquaporin is specific only to water transport. Only water could allow for an oxygen leading into the pore and two hydrogens to allow exit from the mid-pore. This slide demonstrates the water movement from the capillary bed to the dialysate. The initial dialysate sodium concentration is 132 milliequivalents per liter, but in the initial hours of the dwell, the water movement into the dialysate can be demonstrated by the dilution of the dialysate sodium concentration. So, aquaporins are water channels, and just as the name implies, are channels that are selective only to water. As demonstrated here, there is water movement across the peritoneal capillary in response to the infusion of osmotically active dextro solutions, but the solutes dissolved in the water are excluded. The main solute is sodium, and the movement of water across the capillary and exclusion of sodium is termed sodium sieving. Let's look at another illustration of aquaporin function in sodium sieving. In this image, you can see two things. 
The water movement can occur across the small or large pores, but also across the aquaporins. Seen at the bottom, water flow is approximately 50% across the aquaporins and 50% across the capillary small and large pores. Sodium movement, however, does not move across the capillary aquaporins and only occurs across the pores, mainly the more numerous small pores. The sodium is held back by the aquaporins being specific only to water molecules. As sodium is held back, as shown here, it is sieved by the peritoneal capillary aquaporins. This is called sodium sieving, the movement of water across the aquaporin but sodium held back to remain in the plasma. Again, sodium sieving. Therefore, the clinical implications of sodium sieving suggest that rapid cycling in APD patients in an attempt to improve urea kinetics or enhance ultrafiltration may result in more sodium sieving and less sodium removal. This would raise the plasma sodium concentration, trigger thirst, leading to an in increase in fluid intake and a risk of fluid overload. The implications of sodium sieving are clear. Rapid exchanges resulting in more rapid water movement, but the sieving of sodium could lead to the development of thirst, relative hypernatremia, and hyperosmolality. It was this clinical recognition that led to the understanding that dialysate dwell times would need to be of sufficient length, chronically, to allow for the time needed for sodium diffusion across the small pores. Yes, rapid exchanges would benefit urea removal and appear to be a wanted result of PD, yet the observation of the concept of sodium sieving led to the understanding that dwell times would need to be sufficiently long for the sodium removal. This module has briefly reviewed sodium sieving in peritoneal dialysis. For further information on this topic, please review the cited references within this presentation.